One night I, I had white rice. There was this big pain here. I walked into the kitchen, drank some milk, waited for it to push the rice down, and I was, I think what happened is I stopped breathing because it hurt so much. My body said, no, you're not going to die, and it made a seizure when I woke up. The rice was, you know, down. <laughs> but as a result, when I went into the emergency room, I was fibrillating. My second doc, I told him, you know, in Portland, I said, that's what happened to me. I had, this is my rice story. I want to tell it. He said, he looked at me and he says, George, everybody has a story. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have a history of AFib in my family. So my, both my mother and father had it, but my lifestyle is totally different than my parents. I've been athletic all my life. I started riding my bike when I was five and I never got off of it. I've ran 13 marathons, bicycled across the United States, climbed most of the major peaks in the Northwest. And so even though they had AFib, I figured I was going to skip that because my heart was so strong. You know, the AFib grabs you and then you're, you're screwed. I mean, it won't let go. And the drugs didn't work very well on me because I have low blood pressure naturally. So I kept trying to find cause and effect. You know, alcohol's a trigger, caffeine's a trigger, stress is a trigger. I just kept eliminating things one at a time. I went vegan. I stopped exercising so hard. Social engagements were very, very difficult because I would fibrillate and then uh, people around me thought I was dumb. It, it was a huge compromise to my life. I mean, I was, as far as I was concerned, I was circling the drain. I got stuck in this cause and effect dilemma where I thought, well, there's, there must be something causing this and this and that. And, and the, the whole, the end point of all that mental anguish was, no. There's no cause and effect. It's got its own progression. Nothing you can do is going to stop it. The third ablation stopped it. And I really don't remember a lot about the lab, but I remember when I went in there and I laid on the table, there was these two big, I call them Volkswagen bugs. There's one on each side of you big magnets that run the catheter in your body. It's very, very sophisticated, electronic, but they're only as good as the person running it. Dr. Bakta gave me the confidence. He was one of the few people that really understood the stuff that I had gone through. Other doctors didn't even, I had to explain to them what I was feeling, and he, he had it all, it was all right there on the tip of his tongue. It seemed like to me Dr. Bakta was over there. There was another room with a couple monitors, and then I was out five hours. Dr. Bakta said I was one of his tough cases because most people have railroad tracks that where the, uh, the electric signal travels through your heart. There's errant signal pathways, and you just cut them off, and then you're okay. He said, my heart was like fireworks. He said, I had so many spots. The first year I was waiting waiting, waiting, waiting for it to come back. Although Dr. Bakta said, just go do what you want to do. I went back for a yearly checkup with Dr. Rao, my cardiologist, and Dr. Rao said, your chances of getting AFib are the same as the general population of your age. You're just the same as everybody else at this point in time. And that was like a huge weight off my shoulders. And well, I'm gonna try the running again. So I did and it, it worked out like I, I felt like I kind of used to feel, you know. I, I was able to catch my breath. Well, that's a big milestone for me. And it's working out very nicely and I feel great about it and I'm getting in better shape. Everybody has a story. <laughs>